Hello, I'm Deborah Gordon. I'm a professor at Stanford, and I'd like to talk to you today about the evolution of collective behavior. We see collective behavior all around us. Here's an example of collective behavior. It's a group of starlings turning. They have an amazingly fluid way of moving a flock collectively. But of course, there's lots of collective behavior going on around us that we don't see. Gene transcription networks are a form of collective behavior. Cells work collectively. For example, in an embryo, the development of an embryo and differentiation is the result of collective behavior among cells. Cancer cells work collectively to establish tumors. In a brain, neurons work collectively to produce perception and memory and all of the function of brains. What all these systems have in common is that there's no central control. There's nobody in charge, nobody telling anybody what to do. I study collective behavior in ants. An ant colony consists of sterile female workers. Those are the ants you see walking around. And although there are reproductive females called queens, they don't give any instructions or tell anybody what to do. So instead, ant colonies work through local interactions. Although this is the way that most people think about ant colonies, this is a silly picture that's been staged. In fact, this never happens. There's no foreman. There's no bureaucrats. There are no managers. Somehow, the behavior of the colony, the way that it can respond to its environment, arises through interactions among ants. Systems without central control always use networks of local interactions. In ants, those are networks of antennal contact and chemical interactions. In cells, also, those are networks of chemical interactions between cells and between cells and their environments. And so all of these interactions together create a network. The history of biology, especially in the last 100 years, has been to try to understand the function and dynamics of networks. And it began with trying to associate function with type. So illustrated here, for example, is the um, idea of one gene, one protein. Um, then in studies of neuroscience, early on, we hoped to find particular parts of the brain, each of which would do a certain function. And the study of social insects proceeded in the same way by looking at the minority of species in which workers come in different sizes and uh, trying to assign a function to each type of worker. But over time, we've understood that instead, function and dynamics are produced by interactions. In genes, there are very complex regulatory processes that determine the relationship between genotype and phenotype. The function of brains arises from interactions among many different groups of neurons in the brain that form circuits that interact with each other. And in the same way, in ant colonies, we can see how local interactions produce the behavior of the system. So, Ants operate mostly by smell. Most ants can't see. And they smell with their antennae. So one very important interaction among ants is when one ant touches another with its antennae. And when one ant touches another with its antennae, it can tell by the odor whether the other ant belongs to the same colony and what task it's been doing. So here we see a laboratory arena. The ants are moving around and interacting. In this arena, the, uh, there are two tubes connecting to other arenas. When one ant meets another, it doesn't matter which ant it's meeting. They're not exchanging any complicated signals or messages. All that matters to the ant is the rate at which it meets other ants. Taken together, all these interactions produce a network. This illustrates the network and the paths of all the ants that you saw in the film in the previous slide. And it's this constantly shifting network of interactions that produces the behavior of the system. 
Our brain works the same way, but the great thing about ants is that we can see all of the interactions as they're happening. And so we can see how this network of interactions is related to the function of the system. I study ants in the desert in Arizona, and I'm going to be telling you about some of the work that I've done with harvester ants in the south. I'm going to be telling you about some of the work that I've done with harvester ants at a study site in southeast Arizona. This is what uh, the nest of a mature colony looks like. You can see the nest entrance, and then there's a trail leading away from the nest entrance, sometimes cleared, sometimes not, that goes about 20 meters. And these ants are called harvester ants because they eat seeds. So they travel along this trail, collect seeds, and bring them back to the nest. And I divide all the behavior that I see outside the nest into these four categories. Foraging, that's going out and collecting seeds and bringing it back. Then the patrollers, shown here with a magnifying glass, are an interesting group of workers that go out early in the morning. They move around the foraging area. They meet the neighbors. They meet the ants of the other neighboring colonies. And it's their safe return that signals the foragers that it's time to go out. The nest maintenance workers work inside the nest. They line the walls of the chambers with moist soil that dries to a kind of adobe finish. And then they carry out the dry soil. So you see nest maintenance workers coming out, putting down soil, and going back in. And finally, the midden workers work on the refuse pile, or midden, where they put a colony-specific odor that helps guide foragers back into the nest. It's only 25% of the colony that works outside the nest. So these four task groups that I just told you about are only 25% of the colony. Deep inside the nest, which goes down a meter, um, sometimes two, there are ants that are um, storing the seeds and processing the seeds. Uh, the queen is down somewhere. She just lays the eggs. Then there are ants that are feeding the larvae and brood. It's actually the larvae that consume most of the food. And despite what it says in the, bi bi and despite what it says in the Bible about how hardworking ants are, there are a lot of ants that are just hanging around doing nothing. And it's a very interesting question about the function of the network, why the colonies, it's a very interesting question about how that group of reserve or inactive colonies might function to contribute to regulating the network of interactions. In this species, as in most ant species, all of the ants are the same size. So you can't identify the task of an ant by its size, but you can identify the task of an ant by what it's doing. And it turns out that ants change tasks. So this shows the results of experiments in which I created a need for more ants to do a certain task. So the arrows point to the, um, the arrows show the outcome of experiments where I created a need for more ants doing that task. So for example, if more ants are needed to forage, then the patrollers will change to forage, the midden workers will change to forage, and the nest maintenance workers will change to forage. In response to a lot of really exciting new food that I put out there, everybody will switch to forage. If there's a need for more patrollers, so for example, if I create a disturbance, then the nest maintenance workers will switch to do patrolling. But if more ants are needed to do nest maintenance, so for example, if I create a mess that the nest maintenance workers have to clean up, then none of the others will switch back to do nest maintenance work. And they have to get new nest maintenance workers from the younger ants inside the nest. So there's a one-way flow of ants from the younger ants inside the nest through nest maintenance some of them become patrollers, and everybody eventually ends up as a forager. And once an ant is a forager, it doesn't come back. All of this is regulated by the interactions of ants as they come in and out of the nest. And so this process that I call task allocation is the process at the level of the colony that gets the right numbers of ants to each task in a given situation. And so now we understand that it's this regulatory process of task allocation that determines how the system functions, not the inherent characteristics of any particular ant, but the regulation of the whole system that shifts ants around into different tasks as they're needed in changing conditions. 
So this raises the question, how do these interaction networks evolve? How does evolution shape the regulation of a system with no central control? I'd like to begin with a quote from Dobzhansky that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution, and to modify that in my own way by saying that nothing in evolution makes sense except in the light of ecology. And what I'd like to do now is to explain that in more detail. So ecology comes from the word for village. Ecology is about how different parts of a system interact. And we think of ecology in terms of interactions at different levels. First, interactions among individuals, like the tree shown here, and then interactions within a population and between populations, where a population is the set of all individuals that may reproduce with each other. So populations are defined in terms of reproduction. And then a community is all of the populations that are living together and interacting in a certain place. So here, there are some birds. Um, in the forest, of course, there are many, many kinds of organisms in the community that that forest is part of. And we could go even one level up and think about the interactions between all of those organisms and all of the other factors that affect them, like the air and the water and the wind and all of the chemicals that are circulating through the system. Ecology is the science that helps us to understand how all of these interactions lead to changes in a system. And so when we want to ask how do interaction networks evolve, we really have to ask how does evolution react to the interactions within the system? So we have to think about ecology to understand evolution. Another way to think about the relationship between ecology and evolution is to think about what natural selection really is. Nat natural selection requires three conditions. First, there has to be variation in a trait. And we can think of a trait as anything. It could be eye color, or the height of a tree, or the time of year that the tree flowers, or how thick the polar bear's fur is. A trait could be anything, including how individuals within a system interact to regulate that system. So first of all, there has to be variation. Then that trait has to be heritable. Because natural selection acts over many generations. And if the trait is inheritable, if the offspring don't resemble their parents, then over many generations, things might reshuffle, but there will be no trends. And finally, and here's where the ecology comes in, there has to be, and finally, here's where the ecology comes in, there have to be differences in reproductive success related to the trait. The trait has to make a difference ecologically to how the organisms survive and reproduce. So here's a diagram to illustrate that. So here, let's imagine that we have lots of individuals in a population. And each row in this diagram is going to be a different generation. And the different colors represent the trait. So the trait here is color. And some of them are blue, some are red, some are orange. That's the variation in the trait. So there's a variation to start out with. And then that trait is heritable. So blue circles make more blue circles. Red circles make more red circles. Orange circles make more orange circles. The offspring resemble their parents. So it's heritable. And now, here's where the ecology comes in. In order for there to be any change over generations, some of these individuals have to reproduce more than others. And in this story, let's say that it's really great ecologically to be orange. And so over generations, there will be more orange individuals because their ecology is such that they can reproduce more. And here we get natural selection, a change over many generations in the frequency of individuals that are orange. That's how natural selection works. And it always requires an ecological process that affects the reproductive success of the trait in such a way that some individuals reproduce more than others. So when we ask how do interaction networks evolve, really we're asking an ecological question about why networks function differently in a given environment so that some forms of an interaction network allow more reproduction than others. 
So we could ask this question about cancer cells. We could ask, why is it that certain ecological conditions within a body allow the evolution of particular types of cancer and allow the cancer cells to change over generations of cells? That's a difficult question, although it's one that's really important. And we can also ask the same kind of question about ant colonies. And there, because we can see the interactions among ants, and we can look at them in their environments, we have the opportunity to learn how interaction networks are evolving in certain environments. So there are more than 12,000 species of ants. They live in every conceivable habitat on Earth. And they all have to solve ecological problems because they have to explore their environments, they have to get resources, and then they have to reproduce. And when we look at different species, we can see how interaction networks are evolving to work differently in different environments. So one species that we study in my lab is the Argentine ant. It's an invasive species. They came from Argentina. They have spread around the world. And everywhere that there's a Mediterranean climate, there are now Argentine ants on the coast of California, the uh, coast of South Africa, Australia, the whole Mediterranean coastline, Japan, Hawaii. And one of the interesting things about how their interaction networks operate is how different they are from other ant species. Um, many ant species use interaction networks to create what is called central place foraging. So you can think of it like a broom. The ants all live in one nest. They go out to forage, and they bring their resources all back to the central nest. But Argentine ants, like other species, are really good at a different kind of strategy. They make circuits. It's more like a vacuum cleaner. They move from nest to nest. They have many different nests. They move from nest to nest, and they sweep up resources as they go. So they create a different kind of interaction network that functions differently from the species that use central place foraging. And one of the things that we've been studying is how new paths form. And we find that Argentine ants actually recruit from the trail, not the nest. That is, they create a large network, like the vacuum cleaner going around. If you're operating a vacuum cleaner, instead of going all the way back to a corner of the room all the time, you keep moving the vacuum cleaner from wherever you are. And that's the way that Argentine ants work also. In the tropics, we see different kinds of interaction networks. One of the species that we're studying is the turtle ant. And uh, here you can see ants marked um, those green ants and the pink ants are marked with nail polish by us. They're not really that color. And we did that in order to see how ants are allocated on different trails. And what we find is that ants create circuits in the trees, ongoing circuits, again like a vacuum cleaner, from nest to another nest, for, to a food source. So the ants create a circuit in the trees from nest to food sources and back again, around and around. And those circuits are shaped by negative interactions with ants of another colony. So for example, here you can see another Cephalodes species plugging up its nest entrance with its head in response to negative interactions with a different species, those smaller ones running around with their abdomens in the air. And so this species has a form of security that's based on interactions with ants of other species. And they regulate the flow of ants in and out of the nest based on those interactions. So ants are using interactions differently in a huge range of environments. And we can study the evolution of collective behavior by understanding ecologically how the function of a network in one environment affects the reproductive success of the colonies using that network. Interaction networks evolve in response to environmental challenges. And so the way to study the evolution of collective behavior is to try to understand how interaction networks are operating in particular environments and what that means for the survival and reproductive success of the system using those networks. Thank you.